Welcome to Public Health On Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Our focus is the novel coronavirus. I'm Josh Sharfstein, a faculty member at Johns Hopkins and also a former secretary of Maryland's Health Department. Our goal with this podcast is to bring evidence and experts to help you understand today's news about the novel coronavirus and what it means for tomorrow. If you have questions, you can email them to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, guest host Dr. Sarah Bennett talks with Dr. Tim Robertson from the Department of International Health. They discuss a paper he co-authored. The paper estimates that COVID-19 could cause staggering increases in child and maternal mortality due to disrupted care in low and middle income countries. Let's listen. Dr. Robertson, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure. Together with colleagues, you've recently published a paper that looks at how the COVID-19 epidemic may affect maternal and child deaths across 118 low and middle income countries. I wondered if you could start out by explaining to me what your original intent was in writing this paper. Yeah. So obviously a lot of us are worried about the number of people who are going to die from COVID-19. First, we've seen the pandemic play out in high income countries and now we're starting to think about how the pandemic may play out in low and middle income countries. In many of these countries, health systems are not as strong as they are in high income countries. And because of the pandemic, the mere fact of the pandemic, we think that many people may die because not of COVID-19 itself, but because the health system comes under strain or because of other effects of the pandemic, for example, things like social control measures. And we talk about these sort of other effects as indirect effects. So the direct effects are people who die from COVID-19 and the indirect effects are people who die because of the consequences of the pandemic. And in our paper, we sought to try to estimate the indirect effects on maternal and child mortality. So about a month ago, people started raising the alarm about what the pandemic could mean for maternal and child health in low and middle income countries. And a lot of people started to speculate and sort of throw around big numbers of kind of what the effects could be. Our goal was to try to put some realistic estimates on those numbers and sort of help policymakers gauge the magnitude of the problem. So what could those indirect effects be and how could they start to think about them and start to plan for how to, for example, mitigate some of those effects. So if I understand correctly, you did that by looking at various scenarios with some scenarios being better ones where the circumstances were not so bad and some being sort of slightly more severe scenarios. I wondered if you could just describe briefly to me the differences across those scenarios and then also what the impacts there were in terms of maternal and child health. Yeah, so in our first scenario, we assumed that there might be some kind of effect, but perhaps not much. So, for example, there'd be some restrictions in the number of people who could access health facilities. There would be some disruption to the health system. Maybe some health workers were reassigned to work on COVID rather than on their usual jobs. And in that kind of lower severity scenario, we estimated that over three months, we would see 120,000 child deaths and 6,000 maternal deaths. And in our sort of more severe scenario at the other end, where, for example, we imagine that you might see bigger disruptions to the health system, so health workers themselves becoming sick or being reassigned, perhaps problems with supply chains for certain types of medicines, and then maybe greater restrictions where people couldn't come to health facilities, had trouble, for example, traveling, or maybe were afraid to travel to health facilities. In that more severe scenario, we estimated that uh, over three months, we would see 600,000 child deaths and 30,000 maternal deaths. And if we played that scenario out for six months, we would see over 1 million child deaths and over 100,000 maternal deaths. 
So those sound like really big numbers, but I wonder if you can put them into some perspective for me. There's obviously already quite a lot of um, kids and, and mums dying uh, in, in low and middle income countries. What, what difference do these additional deaths make over the baseline? So if you think about it in terms of additional deaths per month, this would be, so for example, for our lower scenario, that would translate to a 10% increase in child mortality and an 8% increase in maternal mortality. And for our more severe scenario, that would equate to a 45% increase in child mortality and a 38% increase in maternal mortality. Mm. So these really are quite significant, not just the numbers, but the, the impact over and above what's already going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, particularly when you think about how long it has taken the global health community to gradually bring down sort of under five child mortality, this would represent, I think, quite a big setback, although, albeit temporary, we hope. Um, I wonder, would it be true to say that most of these additional deaths that you're saying could occur would happen because people can't access health services? Or is there something else going on that's, that's driving this? Yeah, so I think you could group kind of our indirect effects into two broader categories. The main one being sort of things that are mediated through the health system. So as you said, there would be effects because people can't actually get to health facilities. So for example, they can't travel, as I said, they might be afraid of traveling or perhaps they have reduced incomes because of unemployment and then they can't pay for services. Or for example, health workers have been reassigned or sick or supply chain issues. And I think most of our interventions in our analysis kind of fall into that category where people are sort of not getting care that sort of routine care that they might usually get. But there's this other category of kind of indirect effect, which is mediated outside the health system. And for us, that sort of features in our model when we think about wasting. So wasting is when a child is sort of low weight for their height. So they're malnourished, uh, they're not getting the kind of macronutrients and they're wasted. And wasting doesn't kill people itself, but rather increases the likelihood that a child would die when they have an infectious disease. So you sort of capture this health, health consequences from wasting, which is not necessarily part of the health system, but would kind of become more problematic for other sort of reasons. So for example, the World Food Programme has raised alarms around the number of people who are already food insecure, but saying that because of the pandemic, because of people's movement restrictions, because of the effects on agriculture and the economies, that the number of people who are food insecure might even double. So if you think about that, we have more people who are not getting access to food, not getting access to macronutrients. That will then increase the number of children who are wasted, and that will then increase the likelihood that they might die if they are infected. So you have that kind of the one causal pathway through the health system where people not getting their routine services, but then this kind of other pathway outside of the health system through, for example, children being wasted and, and increased death that way. Mm, thank you. So correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like this puts um, healthcare leaders in a really difficult position. You know, on the one hand, they need to pursue social distancing strategies necessary to control the epidemic. But particularly in the context of low and middle income countries, those same strategies could conceivably have some negative effects in terms of people's ability to access health and health services. I wondered if you had any thoughts about the kind of factors that health policy makers should bear in mind in terms of navigating uh, this dilemma. Yeah, I think it really is a, a difficult situation and that there certainly will be kind of trade-offs that need to be considered. I think one thing that I think about is for example, putting in these types of health systems interventions into different categories. So if, if you think about it, there are certain types of interventions or health services that if they are disrupted for a short period of time, you may be able to make up for them immediately after the pandemic. So for example, I'm thinking about some types of vaccines or perhaps antenatal care. So if a mother or a child doesn't receive that service in one month, in a certain month, but then there is a catch-up campaign or that's made up for, they just receive it a little later, then 
the effect on their population will kind of be minimized. It's not, it doesn't sort of translate in the long term. And then there's a second category of intervention, which are interventions that, you know, need to be delivered in that moment, but perhaps could be delivered in different ways than they are currently being delivered. So for example, rather than someone having to go to a health facility, they might be able to receive that service through a community health worker in their, in their village or their community. We might be able to shift some interventions to a kind of more of that kind of ground level door-to-door -door campaigns, for example, or perhaps other novel delivery mechanisms, maybe thinking like sort of telemedicine and perhaps maybe some consultations via phone if we're not able to have kind of face-to-face -face interactions. But then importantly, there's this other category of interventions where you have to deliver them kind of with a healthcare provider and they can't be made up at a later date. So here I'm thinking of something like um, childbirth delivery. If a mother has obstetric complications, postpartum hemorrhage, uh, sepsis, eclampsia, they need that treatment straight away right then and there. And there's not really escaping the need to kind of continue those services uh, if we want to uh, maintain kind of levels of maternal health. So I think just by thinking about those kind of different types of interventions and perhaps kind of thinking about other ways of delivery and potentially moving towards some sort of prioritization over certain months, I think that might be helpful and, and the way forward. Thank you. So if I were to try and sum up what you just said, Dr. Robertson, it might be that, you know, for some things we can deliver them later, others we need to deliver them differently. And then there's some that we really must deliver now. And maybe policymakers can keep that in mind as they're trying to um, work their way through this current crisis. Thank you yeah. very much for joining me today. I mean, I think you've described some really challenging circumstances in low and middle income countries that the epidemic gives rise to, but also hopefully begun to outline some tools, approaches that uh, people can use as they think about how to adapt services to the current context. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Public Health on Call, a new podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Please send questions to be covered in future podcasts to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. This podcast is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Lamare Morales. Audio production by Niall Owen McCusker and Spencer Greer, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Thank you for listening. <laughs>